Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It is so nice to be in front of all of you today. I just, um, well, okay, so hi, I'm an alcoholic, and my name's Arwen. Uh, I am a member of the Welcome Group. We meet uh, Mondays and Thursdays at 8 o'clock. Uh, Thursdays is our closed meeting. Monday, uh, Monday. I, I swear, Sundays is our open meeting. Um, we'd love to have you come and visit. We're just north of Davisville for those who live in Toronto. Um, yeah, this is, I mean... I don't know. I love the ORC. Um, I actually spoke on the newcomers panel when I first came in, and well, I was a newcomer, and uh, I had about a year of sobriety. And um, I remember I spoke, and you know, afterwards I thought, okay, so begins my illustrious career as a circuit speaker in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am back 19 years later. So, <laughs> so. Here I am. I stuck it out, and ha-ha. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just want to thank Deborah for asking me to share, Carly for the introduction, Scott and Amir, thank you for reading the steps and the traditions. I um, was happy. I was sort of like, slow down. It's good. It's good. Let's. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I am just going to turn my timer on. I know I've got timer people, but I just want to make sure that I get sober at some point. So... Um, I can check in now, and then I'll be like, oh, not sober yet. Need to get moving. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Toronto. I've done everything in Toronto. I've never lived, well, aside from a brief, briefly in Brampton, Ontario, and Peterborough, Ontario, I've lived in Toronto my entire life. Um, I am, uh, you know, uh, when I was drinking, uh, I wanted to do geographical cures, but they usually involved moving out and then moving back to my mom's. Like, that was my geographical cure. Um, I have been full of fear uh, for as long as I can remember. I, I just was born with it. Um, the fear manifested, it, it translated into anxiety. I was an anxious kid. I was an anxious baby. I was the kind of, my mom always talks about the fact that you couldn't put me down. It was impossible to get me to sleep. I, I just came out of the womb scared, you know? And... Um, because I didn't have any other solution, um, I immediately set out, even as a child, to fix my outsides to make me stop feeling scared, you know? So what that looked like was, and I always felt behind, you know what I mean? I always felt like I never got it right. Something needed to be fixed. I wasn't, I remember, I lived in a house which was at the end of a street, but because it didn't center with the sh end of the street, it was off. Like, everything about me was off. I started doing ballet when I was seven, but I didn't start when I was four, so I was behind. You know, like, I was seven and being like, darn it, mom. You know, um, I, uh, I was one of those kids in school that um, just, you know, when she's interested, she focuses. When she's not interested, pew you know, um, and I mean, I started skipping school when I was seven, we'd have recess and I'd start hiding in the bathrooms and then the teachers would have to come find me and, the, and I'd move from bathroom to bathroom and it'd be like this arcade game of this seven year old just like moving, you know, cause the, the, for me it was, it was seek out and avoid, you know, I just wanted to avoid. I, I just wanted to stay home all the time. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't want homework. I was also one of those people, it's like, and, you know, I didn't know how to do things simply. And by the way, of course I didn't know how to do things simply. I was a child. But I didn't, so I'd get an idea for something, and I'd skip eight steps ahead to the part where it was amazing, and then I'd totally get freaked out, and I wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? Because I, I didn't learn, like, I wanted to be amazing at everything right away because I had this belief that if I wasn't good at it, then I was bad at it. If I was bad at it, then I was stupid. You know, I didn't understand, you know, learning or any of that stuff. So anyway, um, my father got sick when I was nine and he died when I was 15. So basically from nine to 15, I mean, at nine, that was sort of the end of the childhood portion of my life and our, my life was, became focused around a dying parent. And uh, he had heart disease, and yeah, and then he died, and um, 
uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I had a drink when I was nine. Uh, I got a little drunk and I had a little hangover and that was it. Uh, I certainly didn't like touch my lips and away I went. And in fact, what I did was, um, to manage my feelings when my father died was I, I, it was control. So I cried the night he died. And then I said, that's it, you're done crying. And I didn't cry again for four years, unless it served me. If it served me, I cry. But I, I didn't cry for four years. I, it would come up, and i just, <clears throat> down you go. The other thing was I had a family member who, I don't, she never identified herself as an alcoholic, so I don't know, but she certainly had similar symptoms to my own. And so I decided when I was 13 that I was never going to drink, I was never going to smoke, and <laughs> I wasn't going to have sex until I got married. Anyway, here I am. And... Um, <laughs> I'm actually a nun. No. Um, well, anyway, but I was about to go down a rabbit hole, and I'm not going to do that. Anyway, um, so the point is, is that that is the way I tried to manage it. Um, it took me a while to found, find the best solution of all time, or at least what I thought was the best solution of all time. So I spent my teens, you know, um, when I was 16, my goal in life was to be to speak patois. Um, uh, be a pool shark and hang out at Young and Dundas forever. Like that was it. That was my goal in life was just to like, or look, kiss, be able to kiss my teeth for like, you know, like I can't even do it anymore. But it was like, this thing was very important to me, you know? And it was like anything to feel powerful, right? Anything to feel like I fit in. I mean, I was like at eight obsessed with like name brands and I had to, Gabe, uh, the speaker at one o'clock, he was talking about that. Like I had to have the clothes and I didn't have parents who agreed with me. So they would buy, they were like, I'm not going to spend that much money on, you know, something you're going to wear for like months, you know? Um, so then that didn't make me feel right. Anyway, I'm going to just fast forward because, you know, so I'm practicing this control. I'm judging the world. I was very con controlling. I remember my sister. I was. Uh, I was. I, it took me seven years to get through high school, um, and uh, I, I always say I was in the special program. <laughs> it took me a little while. Uh, I went to five different high schools. So, like I said, I never did a geographic cure in terms of leaving the city. But man, I moved around a lot in the city, um, and uh, yeah. I, <laughs> That's how I rolled, and then um, at the end of high school, I got into uh, I f got into a business that's really hard to get into, and I was given work right away, and that's like the alcoholic dream, right? Like I, I get into a hard business, uh, and and I'm getting work, and I'm getting validation, and the outside world's saying, "Hey, you're pretty cool," and I'm like, "I am pretty cool," and I'm hanging out with the cool kids, and we're doing cool things, and and then people were like, you know, you should probably start taking classes, and I'm like, ooh. Then I might look stupid. Then it might be revealed that I actually don't really know what I'm doing. And yeah, I'm talented, but I don't, you know. And um, and I would do, you know, uh, maybe you can relate to this. I would do the thing where I, someone would say, you should take this class. Oh, yeah, I'm totally going to take that class. Like, next, I, mm, I'm too late to register, but I'm going to do it. Yeah, for sure I'm going to do it. And um, and then they'd say, what about the school? Yeah, I'm totally, I got the brochure for that school, and I'm going to go. Not now, though, because it's too late, but I'm going to go. And then um, right around that time, I uh, started working at what I like to call the alcoholic candy store, which is the service industry. And uh, I started working there, and very quickly, because the service industry, you know, like you'd have a drink after work. And, I mean, throughout my teens, I'd gotten drunk a few times, and I really liked it, but that, like, that line just didn't get crossed. You know, control was really working for me. Um, so as you can imagine, when I finally took a breath, uh, when I, that was, I think, what happened in terms of when I, when alcohol became my solution. Control was killing me, so I decided, I didn't decide, it was like I started working at this bar, and within three months, it just, I crossed the line, and alcohol became something that I had to have, and I couldn't drink enough of it, and except um, almost immediately, I'd have friends looking at me and saying, you know, like, what happened to you last night? Like, you were fine, and then you were crying, and then you were dancing on the bar, and who was that guy? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what happened, you know? I don't know 
why I want to take off the moment I drink and that nothing's good enough. So like, you know, you put alcohol in my system and now that feeling of not being good enough, nothing's good enough. So now that geographic that I was doing with seven, you know, seven years of uh, high school going to five different high schools, now it's like bar to bar to bar. You know, every serving job I'd have within a year, my manager would kind of look at me. I used to say that I get quit fired. You know, like the manager would look at me, I'd look at the manager and we're like, yeah, we're done. Um, you know, then I'd move on to the next restaurant. And they're like, you're amazing. I'm like, thank you. And then I drink and it was like, ooh. And then I, you know, and then I did all the things you do when you're drinking. Like, you know, another person's boyfriend it can be my boyfriend. That's okay. It's fine. Um, we were just drunk. It happens. Um, yeah, so, and then... Um, so anyway, it just got bad really quickly, and uh, I'd heard of AA through uh, the OG 90210 and Party of Five. <laughs> uh, Dylan was sober, and he like wasn't really into the God thing, rest his soul. And um, and then what was his name? Scott Wolf Bailey. Bailey was in AA as well, and so I'd heard of AA, and uh, it was like where cute guys went to get against God or whatever. And uh, so as my drinking, I mean, it was quick and nasty, you know, like I started drinking when I was 21. I was in AA by 30, like, whoosh, you know, and uh, so I actually fast forward um, in a fit of being a victim. I uh, really needed to go to an AA meeting. And so I, um, Anyway, I my sister came with me. We biked for my mom's because, like I said, I was doing my geographic. I'd move out. Mm, rent means not as much drinking. Move back to my mom's. Move out again. And um, anyway, I was up. I was in a mom sequence of my living. And uh, so my sister and I went to this meeting. And I sat at the back. And I was like, Oh my god! I hope nobody sees me. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! And uh, and my sister's not an alcoholic, so she had a great time. She loved the meeting. <laughs> She loved the speaker. She was moved, um, and she clapped, and she was sitting up straight, and I was like this in my seat, and the only thing I really took from that meeting was that the guy who did the slogans was cute. I was like, well, maybe. Um, and then at the end, they were like, oh, there's coffee and refreshments, and my sister's like, coffee and refreshments? I'm like, we're out of here. <laughs> like, I am done. That was, no, that is not me. Uh, so we ran out of there, or I ran out of there, and it was like we got on our bikes and went back to my mom. So I was 28. So I decided I'm going to stop drinking when I'm 30 because that's the end. And uh, so, but like I didn't want to go to AA. I wanted to go to Promises Treatment Center in Malibu. <laughs> I, I was fancy, and I needed special treatment. So I needed to go to a special treatment center that Ben Affleck went to. And uh, so, you know, on my mom's, I remember I'd be watching Rosie O'Donnell, but totally strung out, um, and thinking like, yeah, I'll go to Promises, and then one day I too will be on Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> anyway, um, so for the next two and a half years, I, um, I, I'm very fortunate that when I came back in, I stayed. And... Um, uh, part of it has to do with the fact that I spent two and a half years trying really, 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 really hard never to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. Ever, ever, ever. No way. Promises Treatment Center, maybe. But Alcoholics Anonymous, absolutely not. Maybe after Promises Treatment Center. Anyway, so, and it, you know, the thing is, is I went to a meeting, though. So AA was already in me. So for those two and a half years, you know, I'd be wasted and talking to people going, like, I really need to go to AA. And they're like, oh, and by the way, just after my first AA meeting, I discovered the powdered form of alcohol, and away I went. Um, because what it did was is I was able to, like, do that, and I could drink more without puking because by that point, I was, I remember I went over to someone's uh, house and they had beer and I downed five beers. They were like, whoa, that was fast. And it's like, yes, and now I'm going to go to the washroom. <laughs> and I, well, and I was throwing up. But if I used the powdered form, I didn't have to throw up and I could keep drinking. And then I just needed to balance it so that I could read palms. I just read people's palms. That was like my thing. I was very psychic. <laughs> and
And uh, I, you know, I learned the tricks of the trade. I learned that when you wake up and you don't know where you are, look for a piece of mail. That's how you find out where you are, so that you call the cab company. Um, you know, I also, you know, in those last, I mean, I was doing this beforehand, but um, in those last two and a half years, like, re I was, I would do, I had a sponsee once, and she knew the same dealers that I'd known, and she was like, oh, the things we had to do, and I'm like, oh, you had to do it? I just did it. You know what I mean? Like, to get what I needed, I didn't care. If you had what I needed, I didn't care who you were. You know, you were my best friend for the night. I had the beginning of the night friends and my end of the night friends. And during the day, I'd answer the phone to the beginning of the night friends, but not the end of the night friends. And the, Like, thank God I didn't, <laughs> there's no Facebook when I was drinking. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, the pictures that definitely would have been there. <sighs> so, anyway, I spent two and a half years trying not to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous. So... <clears throat> I got this job, and it paid me a lot of money. And so because of that, I was able to drink and use the way that I wanted to without having, I mean, drink. I didn't really like paying for drugs. <laughs> so I'd find people to help me with that part. But um, I drank my way through all of it. And then, um, you know, because I was living under this delusion, this story that I told myself that alcohol made me feel better. Right. I remember my mother saying, like, maybe you should stop drinking. I was like, Mom, I can't stop drinking. I get headaches when I'm not drinking. So I have to drink so I don't get headaches. My mother's like, <laughs> I was like, it makes sense uh, if you think about it. So the thing was, I believed every time that I drank, I believed that this time, or I didn't even think this time, I just believed that it was going to work. And that's what that mental obsession, that idea that was etched into my head that alcohol is the best solution and, you know, the drugs are the best solution of all time, um, was just wedged in there. And that's why I always went back, you know, the longest I went without drinking, um, prior to coming, see, I'm checking, prior to coming into AA was, uh, uh, six weeks. I went to an addiction therapist who gave me a dollar, dollar store wand and said, just focus your energy when you feel like you're going to drink into this wand. <laughs> So that wand was across the room really quickly. Like it flew across the room, and I stopped seeing him. Anyway, um, I'm going to uh, fast forward that, too. Uh, when I came back in, um, by the end of my drinking, I was at the point where I was like, well, you're doing it for alcohol and drugs. Why not start doing it for money? Like, who cares? I just had turned into a robot. You know, I, um, I was so ashamed. I, I felt like as my father's daughter, I'd failed. <laughs> You know, and that, and I was, I just didn't care. And then, um, this one uh, morning, I met this, I'm sure, very nice gentleman who I brought back to my apartment, and I'd lost my keys. And he said, Well, you can come back to my house. And I said, No, 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 that's okay. I think I'm going to go to my mom's. And my mom had said to me, You're not welcome at the house. And because I'd done this many times, shown up really wasted and then spent a few days drying out at my mom's, and then away I went. And she'd said to me, You're not allowed. But for whatever reason, I'm like, I just need to go home. And so my mom opened the door, and she said, what happened to you? And I was like, I just need to sleep. I just need to sleep. And so then the cycle began, which was I basically was holding it together. Like, I believed an alcoholic drank every day, so I held myself together till Friday, and then I'd basically give myself alcohol poisoning every Friday, and then I'd vomit all day Saturday. And then I'd have what I used to call Black Sundays, because on Sundays... Um, my body would be feeling better, but my mind was like tar, you know, because I was just remembering, because I, I didn't black out. I, like, I blacked out once my whole drinking. I remember, I'd remember everything. It was like I'd wake up and there was this slideshow of like, whoosh, 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 of everything I'd done. I was like, oh my God. Oh, oh. Anyway, so I do the thing. I get there. I throw up all day. I'm having my black Sunday. I'm on the phone with my friend on the Monday going like, I just need to see my therapist more often because if I could do that, then I can drink like normally. Um, and then on the Tuesday, I'm yelling at my mom, um, you know, you wanted to bring me down. I'm down. You want me to be nothing. I'm nothing. And for whatever reason, my mother looked at me and she said, who are you talking to? And it hit me. I was like, like I'm talking to booze. 
I mean, it wasn't necessarily like that, but you know what I mean? So then, uh, so I, I'd been going on the internet and reading stories from the AA website and relating and saying like, I'm gonna, oh, you know what, I'm gonna go to a meeting. I'm gonna go to a meeting on Wednesday. So this will be on Sunday. So I'm gonna go to a meeting on Wednesday. I'm gonna write it down. I'm going to the meeting on Wednesday. <clears throat> Monday, going to the meeting on Wednesday. Tuesday, probably going to the meeting on Wednesday. Wednesday, maybe next week. And uh, so when I had this opening, I went, I need to get on the internet. And this was back, uh, so my sobriety date is March 21st, 2005. And uh, back then, in the olden days, the uh, internet would go down frequently. So when I went to go upstairs to read my stories, my mom said, well, the internet's down. And I was like, oh, man. So uh, she said, well, why don't you call AA? And I was like, well, I don't have their phone number. And she's like, well, maybe they're in the phone book. And I looked at her and I was like, <clears throat> mom, they're anonymous. They're not gonna be in the phone book, <laughs> okay? And she's like, well, just look. And I'm like, okay, secretly like, please don't be in the phone book. Please don't be in the phone book. Please don't, damn it. So I called and I always say, I feel like I got a real alcoholic on the line. I had a guy pick up the phone and he was like, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's an alcoholic. And, uh, and he said, you know, do you want to go to treatment? And I didn't want to go to treatment because I was a cokehead and I believed that uh, if you weren't going to promises, then you were going to be with crackheads. If you're a crackhead, I'm not insulting you. I am not insulting you. I would have done it. It just never got in front of me, but that's the way I thought I was fancy. I don't need to go to treatment in Toronto. Um, so he said, well, can you, you know, get to a meeting tonight? And I said, yes. And this time it was completely different. I have a thing that I, I really love, which is if something, if somebody wants to go, there's nothing I can do or say to make them stay. And if somebody wants to stay, there's nothing I can do or say to make them go. And so when I went to that meeting, I was telling you all, make me stay because I need to stay. I have nowhere else. To, oh, I have nowhere else to go. You make me stay. I went by myself. I didn't drag anyone with me. I sat in the middle this time instead of the back. I had a toque down to here, turtleneck up to here. I was wearing a parka that was too big for me because I'd wrecked my, my winter coat, um, and raggedy pants that were like Abercrombie and Finch, so I thought it still looked fashionable, and um, <laughs> boots, and uh, olden days. And, uh, and this guy turned around, and he was like, you're new, aren't you? And I was like... <laughs> How does he know? <laughs> and then he said, I, I'm going to introduce you to some women. So it was a one-year medallion that night. And uh, the guy that was getting the medallion had an accent. And the world that I'd come from, if anybody had anything that was different from other people, you made fun of it. And nobody did. Everybody got up and they were like, you know, he's done this for the group and he's grown and it's been so beautiful to see him change. And the guy's mom was sitting in the front row and it was just like, I want that. I want my mom to sit in the front row and be proud of me, you know? So after the meeting, these women came up to me and they were like, 10 years, 12 years. And I was like, whoa, no, <laughs> it's too long. That's way too long to be sober. And then this other woman said seven months. And I thought, okay, okay. And that started my journey in AA. And, uh, uh, you know, for me, AA, like, I refused to get a desire chip until I'd been sober for a whole weekend because I couldn't make it past the weekend. I was working in the service industry at the time and I just couldn't get past that drink after work. And so I was like, I'm not taking a desire chip until I'm, unless I'm still sober on Sunday. So a lot, I, I've seen a lot of people get chips and they kind of walk up like, Ugh. but I'd stayed sober for a whole weekend. So I was like, three months, nope, two months, nope, one month. Desire chip. I'm like, me! I stayed sober for a whole weekend. <laughs> like, whoa! And that and that's the thing. That ignited my passion in AA because I hadn't been able to do that, you know? And suddenly I'd stayed sober for a whole weekend. And then I and then I, I a woman came up to me, she said, I'll be your sponsor. I was like, great. And then I got a big book, so I had a big book, I had the sponsor, you need a home group. Don't know what that is, don't care, go to a meeting tomorrow. No problem, because when I left that meeting that night, something lifted in me. I had a little hope. I had a little softening. <sighs> so nice. Anyway, um, so I started in AA, and, uh, you know, here was the thing about AA that I was really worried about, though, is I knew it was a God program. Like, I knew it. You dress it up, you know, God of your understanding and higher power, but, like, let's get real here. <laughs> like, you got to find God. Not, you don't have to find God. I had to find God. Like, you find, it is a God of your understanding. But anyway, so 
I was like, I'm loving everything about AA except there's this whole God thing, and I don't know what to do about this because at some point I'm going to have to get a faith in God because everybody says if you don't get a faith in God, you're going to drink again, and I don't want to drink again. And also, like, it, you know, <laughs> early sobriety is hard. So anyway, I would have these conversations with my sponsor. So my first sponsor didn't – I had that woman who told me she was – and she was great, and we lasted for three weeks. And then I found my sponsor <laughs> – no, she was great, and I saw her at the conference, and I'll always love her because she saved me. You know, she told me I was her sponsor. I didn't know how to ask for a sponsor, and I was just collecting people. So it may have been a three-week-long relationship, but it's a relationship that saved my life, and I'll always be grateful to her. She introduced me to my second sponsor. My second sponsor didn't take people through the big book. And this is where I got confused, too, because we were reading the 12 and 12, but everybody was talking about the big book and how the big book was a textbook for this program. And if you want to find God, you read the big book. And I'd say to my sponsor, why are we reading the 12 and 12? And what is this big book? She's like, yeah, you know, Toronto's like that, blah, blah, blah. So I got really interested in this big book. And um, um, so I went on the primary purpose group in Dallas, uh, had a website, and I would listen to speakers. And that's how I did my first four step was I listened to the speakers from this website. And I did my fourth step. And that was pretty cool. And then I did a fifth step, which was <laughs> nine and a half hours long. Um, I've never let a, I have a sponsee in here, don't get any ideas. And uh, <laughs> we're going to cook our way through that one, let me tell you. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, so uh, I, uh, and then, but for me, the real magic, the first time I really became aware of the presence of God in my life was when I did my ninth step, not my fourth step. The fourth step is like, it's great. You know what I mean? It's really good to get a sense of like how, so um, in the big book, I think it's on page 63, it says how uh, basically we're, it's like a thousand form manifestations of fear, and it goes fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. So what that means is, is I get scared, I tell myself a story about why I'm scared and what the problem is, I decide, and then I decide what I'm going to do about it. I go out and do something about it. It fails because I'm relying 100% on me, and then I'm full of self-pity, and it happens like that. Right? So when it happens with my partner today, <laughs> he says something, I'm like, ooh, scared. I'm like, he's a jerk. <laughs> and then I'm like, he needs to change. And then I say, hey, babe, I really feel like we need to talk about this right now. And he's like, why? I'm like, I just really feel like. And then I'm, then we have the conversation that goes sideways, and then I have to make an amend to him, and it's great. <laughs> um, so anyway, the th that was the first time. So the ninth step was the first time that I really felt the presence of God in my life because going to those people, saying the things, paying things off, starting to pay, actually pay my rent, and, and um, you know, it just, it was mind-blowing. Um, my first prayers were really like, I'd get up in the morning and I'd be like, hey. And then at night I was like, thank you for helping me. And that was like it. But once I, you know, going in and praying into a ninth step and going out and being like, hey, God, give me the strength to do this and then doing it, come on. And then, you know, I, so here's the thing. Um, I joined a group that was very enthusiastic and I was taught a lot of really great things, which was, you know, you shake everyone's hands before you sit down. I don't necessarily do that anymore, but it was really good when I was with the group. And here was the thing. We were all young. We were all really into the big book. We were all really into God. The people I was hanging out with, I thought were super cool. And I wanted to be like the cool kids. And they were all sponsoring too. So I wanted to sponsor. So these were the two things that were really important in my group, the big book and God and carrying the message to the still suffering alcoholic. And if you read the big book, it says it's really important that you got to find this higher power. And by the way, then you have to carry that message, right? And so um, that's what I did. I sponsored. I got involved in AA. I, oh, my God, service, 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 so much service. Intergroup, uh, chair of the operating committee. You know, I did my, my first stint, stint as a circuit speaker at the ORC in the newcomer's room. Uh, okay. And then uh, I did, uh, I was, yeah, I was a big member of my group. And I also, but churning, I believed that because I was a good member of AA that I was supposed to, I had a sponsor who said, you know, people think that because they're a good member of AA, they should get the goods. And that wasn't happening for me. I was at a group 
I moved to another group, and it was nicknamed Match.com because everybody in that group <laughs> seemed to meet and get married and have good marriages. Like, most of them are still married, like, real marriages. And I was sitting there, and, and all my friends are getting married, and I'm participating in weddings, and it was an honor and a privilege, don't get me wrong. But it was like every time someone got married, it was a reminder that I wasn't married yet. Not only was I not married yet, I was dating wrong. I wasn't dating the wrong guys. I was dating wrong because I was dating someone to fix me, to make me feel good, right? Because I believed that not being in a relationship meant that somehow I'd failed as a, as a sober person. And I think it's really important that we talk about what our life is like today, but I also think it's really important that we don't carry the message of marriage and children and a house and a career because sometimes that doesn't happen immediately. It takes time. It takes time to grow up in this program, and when it comes to dating, I need a time to grow up. And when I was 10 years sober, sometimes I feel like I believe today God is my buddy. God loves me. God, I wake up in the morning, and God's like, oh, my God, I've got so much for you today. And I go, yeah, cool. I'm just going to do some things first, and then I'll get back to you. And uh, God's like, okay, cool. Whenever you're ready, I'm right over here. You know? And uh, that's what I did with relationships for 10 years. I dated people and I expected them to fix me. And when a guy said to me, hey, I just don't really want to get into a relationship right now, what I heard was not yet. That's what I heard. Uh, no, but Arwen, I just kind of want to hang out. I don't really want to get, get serious. I was like, yeah, later. We just need to hang out. Don't worry. Just hang out with me a little longer. So with 10 years of sobriety, um, I feel like God sometimes just goes like this. Okay, my turn. And... <laughs> The way that manifests is um, I, I really believe that I should uh, find someone in the program and that we would have a happy marriage like I was seeing with my friends. And um, so when someone came along and they were interested in me, I was like, thank you. I did not think of him as a person. I mean, I did, and I like him, and I'm friends with him today, or, you know, we know each other. And... Um, <laughs> It's complicated. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not in the least bit complicated. It's so not complicated. Anyway, um, but what happened was I dated that person for a while. I didn't listen to them when they told me exactly who they were. I, I, I didn't listen, you know, because I was in my delusion. I found the guy. He's in the program. We're going to date. That's going to be it. And lo and behold, God went, my turn. And this person met someone else, and they fell in love because she actually loved him. She loved him. She wasn't, I mean, I don't know what her motivations were, but she loves him, you know? But what happened was that identity that I created for myself that I believed was, ooh, that I believed was what was going to fix me. It was like he was gone. I was single. I was, I remember it was my 10 year medallion just a couple months before this happened. And it was like, it was great. Everybody got up and they talked about how I was a great member of the group and the legacy and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I have no life. Like, the thing about AA is it says a greater demonstration of our principles is in our homes, occupations, and affairs. What that means is you get the solution here, God, in the big book. Then you go out and you live your life. Because when you're talking, today I'm a recovered alcoholic. Okay? What that means is, is I, I have recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. I don't think about drinking, and when I think about drinking, I don't have a drink. I will always be in spiritual recovery. So, and, yeah. So I was at 10 years of sobriety, and I realized the only place I felt comfortable was AA. And then I suddenly realized I've got a whole life outside of AA that I'm not touching, because in that time, while I was living in this delusion of I need a man, I need a guy in the program, and then we're gonna get we're gonna get married, and you know all that stuff, God was like, and here's a career, and you have respect in your career, and here's a great job, and by the way, it's gonna go on for a long time, and I'm going yeah 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 yeah, you know. So when this person who uh, another person, I'm so grateful that she came along. She's awesome. Um, when this happened, it bounced me out of AA because I didn't leave AA, but AA became a very painful place for me, and I had to fight really hard to stay in AA because it hurt. It hurt hearing this stuff. Everything hurt because, like I said, that identity that I created for myself had died, and I was in grief. 
right? So anyway, the first meeting I went to when I left my home group and I went to this other meeting and I remember I was walking to this meeting and it's a meeting I'd gone to when I was four days sober and I went in and I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And this woman sat down beside me and because of my training in my first home group, I looked at her and I was like, damn it, she's new. I was like, hey, are you new? (laughs) She's like, yeah, it's my second day. So God gave her to me. I sponsored her for six months and I stayed in AA. That was God's gift. God's like, no, 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 you stay, you stay. Don't go anywhere. I love you so much, and we need to stay connected. So I worked with her for six months, and, you know, what I had to do, I, I forced me, I had to go out and get a life. You know, I had to nurture that career. I had to learn how to feel comfortable uh, in all situations. And But the thing that uh, was missing um, in all that time, I did strike a balance. I went to a bunch of different home groups. I'm like, I am geographics girl in that I have had many home groups. Welcome group is like my home base, and every once in a while, I just need to go somewhere else for a little while, and then I just come back to welcome. There's a member of my group recently I left and went to Sunnyside for a hot minute, and uh, my friend, when she heard it, she's like, yeah, she'll be back. And like three months later, I was back. Yeah, you. (laughs) So anyway, but the things I've always stayed consistent with is I've always sought God, and I've always read the big book. Um, so, but here's what happened. I got a very clinical idea of God. Um, in Bill's story, he talks about, you know, we believe in the God of signs. I'm totally paraphrasing, but it's, I suddenly, I read this recently and I was like, oh my God, that was me for, I believe the, the, uh, up until a year ago, um, the way that I believed in God, it was very clinical. I was like, I believe that we're all made of particles, and so you're energy and I'm energy, and it's all about creating energy, but there was no relationship. You know what I mean? It wasn't something I relied on. It wasn't, I'd say I had faith, but I wasn't ever relying on that faith. I was still relying on me, even though, you know, I'd created this new life in AA, things that kind of got blossomed in terms of my career. And so in 2020, once again, I think God went, my turn. The pandemic happened. I lost my serving job. I worked in the service industry the whole time I was in the program. And, uh, like, I was, and for a year and a half, I was financially messed up. But it really forced me to get a spiritual practice and put my faith in God. And then through that, um, there was this uh, big book study called Big Book Awakening. And I'd been interested in it for a long time. And about a year ago, some women and I got together and started working through that book. And because of that today, like, like I said, God's my best friend. Like, that's just how I feel about it. I don't talk to God. I used to think that I, the only, the entryway to God was through very formal prayer and very formal meditation. I still pray and meditate, but my, my prayer is more like, I see it as I call my friend God on the phone. I'm like, hey, so, so what I do, I'm going to tell you guys this. I put on my AirPods when I'm walking my dog. She goes off leash, and I talk to God on my AirPods. I call God, (laughs) and I'm like, hey, God, this is what I have to do today. Um, You know, I've got to see this person. I'm really nervous about this, and I'm not sure about that, but, you know, if I could just ask it, you know, like bring some love into this. There was one time I was going to my mother's, and, you know, it's mother's. But, I mean, like, it's just, you know, mother, it's complicated. That is complicated, very complicated relationship. Um, and I was, I got in my car and I mean, I won't do this, the swearing for you, but there was a lot of swearing and I was like, I don't want to go. I'm tired. She always monopolizes my time. I don't, but you got to do this. I cannot show up at this. If I show up, it's going to be a disaster. You have to come. You have to be there. Fast forward to the end of being with my mom. My mom's like, I had a really wonderful time. And I was like, I did too. You know, like that's the miracle of God working in my life is that I am different. My perception changes. Suddenly my mother isn't someone who's hijacking my time. She's this person who loved me through, you know, maybe to like her kicking, telling me that I couldn't come to the house and that I had to stay, you know, like she loved me through all of this. It's, you know, it's hard for the parents to watch children descend, and feeling powerless over it. Like they can't, they can't save us. You know, when we're kids, sorry, I have a, sorry guys, I have a nephew and he's 12 and I'm terrified. (laughs) 
because he, he's acting a lot like I did, and it's just, I'm terrified. Anyway, I'm praying a lot. Um, anyway, I guess I just, I'm not a mom, I'm an aunt, and uh, but it's still scary when they're entering into their teens and their social media and a whole whack of other stuff now, but anyway. So, but God's on it. God's going to take care of it. And I think the most important thing we can do in any of our relationships is work on, to me, the most important relationship in my life today is with God. It really is. Um, I don't do it perfectly. You know, like I am talking to God every day on my AirPods. I am learning how to listen to God too. You know, I love the idea of two-way prayer is that I pray to God and then I sit and I listen, you know, in the big book, It talks a lot about the fact that we're learning how to develop the sixth sense. You know, um, today for a long time, I did sponsor worship where I was like, I call my sponsor and, and my sponsor would share their experience. And then I'd be like, well, my sponsor told me to do this. And today the guiding force in my life is God. And I, if I go to my sponsor, like earlier today, I went to my sponsor and I said, Hey, listen, I've got to speak today. I am going down a bad tunnel. I didn't sleep very well last night. And so she and I talked, and then we prayed, and then uh, I had a really magical experience happen. Um, but really today, it's God first, and then my sponsor, you know? And I'm trying, I'm <laughs> that relying on God and not relying on my sponsor or a meeting fixing me. At this point, the way that I see meetings is that's an opportunity for me to meet a newcomer. You know, meetings aren't for me anymore. They stopped being for me a long time ago. Did you put the thing up? You did. Okay, I didn't see that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, The uh, A meeting for me is a place to meet a newcomer. Uh, A sponsor to me is somebody who brings me back to God when I walk off the track. And, you know, being here and doing service for AA is just the best way to say thank you so much for saving my life. Everything I have today is because, you know, that guy picked up the phone and went, Alcoholics Anonymous. And that guy who got up in the front of the room and did the slogans and was kind of cute, he said yes that day. And that got me intrigued with AA. So, shoot. Thank you. And thanks for listening to everything. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.